good. All right, thank you for that, ladies. Take your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of John, chapter 21. The Gospel of John 21 uh, is where uh, we are at this morning. We are coming to a close uh, in the Gospel of John. I believe this is uh, message number 59. 50, we've been 59 weeks in the Gospel of John, over a year. And so I've been praying about where the Lord would have us to be after we wrap up uh, the Gospel of John. Uh, I think probably next week might be the end as f in regards to uh, going through the book. Now, I'll say this. No doubt I missed something. No doubt I certainly did. Uh, because here's the thing. Every time you read the Word of God, something always sticks out. Something always does. And so uh, it's been kind of a bittersweet thing just to know that, hey, we're, we're coming to a close. Uh, something that we started over a year ago. Uh, but now uh, we're going to move on. Uh, being in prayer, I think where we might end up on Sunday mornings is going not be in the gospel of John, but might continue on through 1 John and 2 John and 3 John, and then not too sure where we're going to be after that. So, so John chapter 21, uh, let's all stand out of honor and respect for the reading of God's word this morning. I want to thank our guests for joining us here. Uh, it's a blessing to have some guests here and guests of guests. And so church family, if you see a face that's not very familiar to you, I encourage you to go shake their hand, make them, let them know that you're glad that they're here. Come on, that's, that's good. So John chapter 21, we're going to read the first 19 verses here this morning. John 21, verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. On this wise showed he himself. And there were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Canaan and Galilee and the son of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon, say, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. And they say unto him, We also will go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Well, that's encouraging, right? Verse 4, but when, they, when the morning, But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And, they said unto, and he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. And they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from the land, but as it were two hundred cubits, dragged the net with fishes. As soon as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon, and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net, uh, net to land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And now the disciples durst ask him, and none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. Verse 15, so when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young and girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands and another shall gird, gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. Verse 19 this spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. And we'll stop right there. You know, the title of the message is this, where restoration begins. Aren't you thankful for restoration? Absolutely. 
where restoration begins. Let's have a word of prayer, and then you can be seated, and we'll get into the message here this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, once again for this day. And Lord, we're thankful for the warm weather that you've allowed us to have. And, and Lord, Father, no doubt, Lord, we need to hear from you. Father, we need you. So Lord, I pray that as we gathered here this morning, Father, your people, they got up, they got ready, they're here. And, and Lord, they uh, some have even invited guests to join them. Lord, we're thankful for that. And Lord, I pray that as we open the word, dear God, I pray that it would just be so clear to us that this is clearly what you are saying and clearly what you would have us to know. So, Lord, I pray you, you remove me, and Holy Spirit, that you just be use me as a mouthpiece. And, and, Lord, that we might glean from you and hear from your word here today. We love you. We thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Our theme for this year is fearless. That's our theme uh, for 2023. And of course, our theme verse, the 2 Timothy 1.7, uh, spoke of it in Sunday school. For God not giving us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's, the, that's, the, that's what God wants us to do. He doesn't want us to be fearful. With, and we understand that uh, 2 Timothy 1.7, the idea is that we shouldn't allow fear to hinder us from serving God. We, we, we shouldn't allow that. God doesn't want us to be hindered by fear. God doesn't want fear to paralyze us from serving him. He certainly does not. But, but I also want to say this, and I'm not trying to contradict myself or go against our theme uh, for 2023, but uh, I also want to say this, that there is a good fear that we should have. There is. Everybody awake this morning? Okay, all right. There is a fear that God does want us to have. There, there is a fear of reverence for God. Come on. He wants us to fear him in that regard. He wants us to do that. But I think there's a, another healthy fear that we should have. And, and, and listen, this is, a, I, I believe, a healthy fear that every Christian should have. And it's a healthy fear of this, that we understand that every single one of us are capable of backsliding. You know what I mean by backsliding? And what I mean by backsliding is every single one of us is capable of going wayward from God and being cold to the things of God. Listen, th there might be a time in your life where you were closer to God then than you are right now. There may have been a time in your life where serving God, there was an excitement to serve God. There was a joy to serve God. There was an excitement to go to church. There was a joy to shake hands with fellow believers here at church. There was an excitement to sing praises to his name. There was an excitement to say amen. All right, there you go. You, you took the bait. Very good. There, there was that excitement to do that. But, but listen, it's quite possible that over the course of time, we can just kind of just become cold. Right? We can just kind of just become like it's not really a big deal anymore. The things of God can kind of just kind of take a back seat. Church is not that important anymore. Fellowship with believers aren't that important anymore. Going to meetings like men's prayer breakfast or lady meetings, they're not really a big deal anymore. I can afford to miss those types of things. And the things of God are just really just nonchalant. Yeah. Listen, I think that it's capable. We're, well, I know we're all capable. Of getting to that point. And listen. God doesn't want you to. Come on. God doesn't want you. To get to the point of backsliding. Or getting cold. Listen. I can become cold to the things of God. You can become cold to the things of God. God doesn't want that to happen. On February 24, 2001. Uh, a one year old Canadian girl. By the name of Erica. She wandered out of her house and spent the entire night in the Edmonton winter. Ooh. Her mother found her the next morning, and she had appeared to be totally frozen. Her legs were stiff, her body was frozen, and all signs of life had appeared to be gone. She was taken to the children's hospital, the nearest children's hospital there, and praise God, she was resuscitated. Well, that's amazing. It's astounding. To, to the amazement of all, there appeared to be no signs of brain damage. Praise the Lord. And, and the doctors even gave Erica a clear prognosis. Praise God. Hey, 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 listen, when, when we as Christians become backslidden, 
we can become so cold that our, our walk with God and our relationship with God can be completely lifeless. It, it certainly can. But I'm so thankful that we serve a God who is able to bring us to a place of restoration again. Where we can, we're at one point where the things of God were exciting. And then over the course of time, we quit reading our Bibles. We quit fellowshipping. We quit going to church. We quit, uh, we quit praying. And it, we, we've wandered so far away that the world would look at us and say, they don't even look like a Christian anymore. They don't even talk like a Christian anymore. They walk and talk and act just like lost people act and walk and talk and act. But praise God, though we might be seem so coldless, we serve a God who can restore us back again to having a real close, personal walk with him we serve a good God no that's what God's going to do here in our text that's what the Lord Jesus is going to do here you know the, the Lord he in, in in regards to our passage that we just read the Lord he makes his third appearance to his disciples since his resurrection there on the sea of Galilee Peter, he declared that he was going to go fishing. The Bible says it was the Sea of Tiberias. The Sea of Tiberias is the Sea of Galilee there. So I just want to clarify that. But Peter says that he's going to go fishing. Look at verse number 3. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, we also will go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. Now, now I want to just say this, ladies and gentlemen, that in the disciples time frame this is a very unique time period for the disciples because prior to Jesus's crucifixion they were always with him and then when he had died there was that time without him and now they're in a time period of waiting Jesus he appeared unto those disciples in that room when the doors were shut remember that when the doors were shut he appeared and basically and what did he say peace be unto you and he basically was like, hey how you doing so, but not all the disciples were there at that time. And then uh, eight days later, a week later, there was, he was able to meet with all the disciples and Thomas also. And he showed them that, hey, Jesus was no spirit. He's saying, behold my hands, behold my side. Jesus really resurrected. It was a bodily resurrection. And so all the other disciples have seen Jesus up to that point, except Peter. Peter's the only one it's still, who, who is still waiting for that moment. Now, the Bible says that Peter had gone fishing and that entire night they saw nothing. Or he caught nothing. Look at verse number 4 and 5. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then saith unto them, children, have ye any meat? They answered him, no. Now, can you imagine? Well, why why'd they go fishing? Well, they're not fishing for recreational sake. You, you don't spend all night fishing just for the sake of saying, I caught one this big. No, no, that, that, they, they didn't go fishing all night long for that reason. They went fishing. Listen, this is a time period of them waiting. They're waiting for Christ. They would wait for him to appear, and then he would disappear. Wait for him to appear again, then he would disappear. And so now this is a waiting period for them. They're, they're out fishing so that they can survive. They're out fishing so that they can eat. Peter went, uh, went away fishing, and the entire night he caught nothing. And then, so that alone would be frustrating. Come on, you're out there all night long. You're out there all eat to the late hours of the evening. You're starting to see the sun come up, and you don't got one lousy fish. That's frustrating. That's discouraging. You got nothing to show for your efforts. And then all of a sudden, what you hear from the shore is, children, do you have any meat? Have you ever been frustrated with something and then all of a sudden someone just asks you a question and then them asking you a question annoys you? <laughs> Come on. All of us. All of us have. You're out there all night long and all of a sudden you just hear somebody say, you catch anything yet? Well, it, it, I'm reading in between the lines here a little bit. Because the disciples, they just answered with one word. No. Can you hear how they said it? <laughs> Children, have you caught anything yet? Do you have any meat yet? Do you have anything to eat yet? And they, their answer was just, no. No, uh, of course not. And then this is what Jesus does. He, he directs their work. Look at verse number six. He said unto them, 
Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Now, th this is what the Lord does. He tells them to take their nets and to cast it on the right side of the ship. And, and when they did, the Bible says that they were not able to draw it because of the multitude of fishes. So Jesus says, take up your net, throw it on the other side of your ship. And then, and of course, once they do that, verse 11 tells us that there was 153 fishes caught. 153. It's a whole lot better than what they were catching. 153. Now, uh, okay, now... We got to be careful because, listen, there are quite a bit of people who are give or are very into numerology. You know what numerology means? Numerology just means this, that when you see a number in Scripture, there's a, there's a deep study as to what does this number mean? What does is, what is 153 stand for? What does 153 mean? And listen, there, there, I've, I've heard a lot of arguments about what this number might mean. And I, I honestly, I don't remember uh, all of them off the top of my head. Uh, they're, they're, but I, listen, I don't think God was intending that his word be so complicated in that regard. You know, when the Holy Spirit of God inspired John to write down that there was 153 fishes that were caught. Listen, I, I think that... What John was trying to convey that, listen, when they listen and did what Jesus did, then their success. As opposed to doing things their own way, then there's no success. One of my commentators said this. He says, he told them to cast their, the net. They, he told them to cast their net. They obeyed. They caught 153 fish. The difference between success and failure was the width of the ship. We are never far from success. When we permit Jesus to give the orders, and we are usually closer to success than we realize. You know where success was? From this side of the ship to that side of the ship. But the reason why they were successful is because they were obeying who gave the orders. Hey, hey, hey listen, church, we can try to live our lives our own way, and we can try to do things our own way, and we can be up all night trying to quote unquote, catch fish and still come up empty handed and still be frustrated and be very, very unsuccessful. But here's the thing. When you start listening to the orders from our chief shepherd, when you start listening to the orders of the Lord Jesus Christ and you throw your net where he says to throw your net, not where you say to throw your net. Listen, then there's success. Everybody awake? There's success then. Peter, at first, he didn't realize that it was Jesus who gave the order. Verse number seven says, therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. Now, who's that disciple that Jesus loved? Well, that's referring to John. John, he told Peter, listen, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. So here's John. He's on the boat uh, with Peter. And, and then Peter, or he's telling Peter, Peter, that's the Lord who's talking to us. And the Bible says that he put on his, his coat there, his fisher's coat, because he was naked. Not completely unclothed, understand that. But he, he, he put on his fisherman's coat, and he jumped in the water, and he swam to the Lord Jesus. He swam to him. Now, verse number 9, look there. As soon as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish lay thereon, and bread. And then skip to verse number 12. Jesus saith unto them, come and dine. What just happened? Jesus just made them breakfast. They're out all night long. Toiling, fishing, finding nothing. Jesus tells them to throw their net on the other side of the ship. They catch 153. John says to Peter, that's the Lord Jesus. That's him. Peter, he puts on his garment. He jumps in the water and he swims to the Lord Jesus. And in verse number nine, as soon as they were come to the land, the Bible says that there was a fire already made and there was fish on the fire. There was bread on the fire. And this is what Jesus says. He says, come and dine. Hey, let's eat. You, you know, usually when there's food involved, this is what it means. There's fellowship. Usually to, to sit down with somebody at a meal uh, oftentimes in biblical times, it's saying, listen, we are in agreement with one another. Uh, that, that, that's why that when, uh, when uh, in the book of Acts, where, uh, where Peter, he was really hesitant to go into a Gentile's home. 
Because usually Jews and Gentiles, they, they did not get along by any means. And so to go into a Gentile's home, that's saying, hey, we're, we're going to sit down. We're going to have a agree. We're going to agree with one another. We're going to have a conversation with one another. And so here's Jesus. He's saying, hey, come and dine. Let's eat. We're going to be in agreement here. Now, that sounds nice. And that sounds good as we read it here in this chapter. But come on, let's, let's consider some things here. The, the, he made breakfast for the one who denied him. He made breakfast for the one who denied him three times. Okay, in, in Bible days, if a disciple of a rabbi were to deny his rabbi one time, that means this, you burned your bridges. To, to deny your rabbi, to deny your master, to deny your teacher, you, you're saying this, I have cut off all ties with my master. I have cut off all ties with my rabbi. I have cut off all ties with, 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 with the one who I've sat under as being a disciple. I, we have burned the bridge there. There is no longer a relationship there any longer. And so that's what they would do it just one time. Peter denied the Lord Jesus three times. Three times he denied the Lord Jesus. But thankfully, Jesus didn't follow the world's standard. Praise God for that. Instead, this is what he, he invited the men who were struggling all night to catch fish. He invited the men who denied him. He invited the men who were up all night and frustrated and tired. And this is what he said. He says, come on, let's sit down. Come and dine. Let's have a meal together. You know, when Jesus says come and dine, you know what else that proves? He's not a spirit. He's physically eating. He is physically eating real fish. He is physically eating bread. He is not a figment of the disciples' imagination. No, no, he was really there. But what must have been going on in Peter's mind? Seriously. What must have been going on in his mind? I mean, the last time, the last time where Peter... And Jesus, in the Gospel of John, the last time where Peter and Jesus, where they saw one another, this is what happened. Peter was warming his hands by the fire. Someone says, you're one of his disciples, aren't you? And he cursed, and he denied the Lord Jesus, and the cock crew, just like Jesus said that it would. And as soon as that happened, what happened? Peter over here. Jesus over there being surrounded by an angry mob through the crowd. They lock eyes. They see one another. Jesus knows what happened. Peter knows exactly what happened. He did what he said he would never do. Come on. He said that. He said, though all would forsake you, I never will. He said, though all might be offended by you, I never will. I will never deny you. I will die for you. Those were his words. And then when he denied him, the cock crew, they locked eyes. And the Bible says that Peter left and he wept bitterly. That was the last human interaction that they had. And here he is. He's sitting down and he's eating fish and bread with them. What is going on in Peter's mind? What would be going on in your mind? The, 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 listen, the last thing, the last time I saw him, he knows I denied him. I know I denied him. It's like, you know the elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about? You, you ever been in those situations? The awkward elephant in the room that everybody's aware of, but no one wants to bring up. There's Peter. He's sitting there. I, I can just imagine. Maybe he's eating his fish. Maybe he's eating his bread with his head down. Uh, listen, I would be. I would be ashamed. I'd be embarrassed. Wouldn't you? Come on, though. Certainly we would. He's sitting there and he's eating and, and then maybe he looks up and maybe he just, he, he can feel the eyes of Jesus on him. You ever felt someone looking at you? Yeah, if you've ever been in trouble with your parents, you know exactly how that feel looks. Yeah. But he can just feel him looking at him, I'm sure. And then this is what begins to happen. What Jesus does, listen, he doesn't, he never ever lashes out at Peter. He never ever Rakes him over the coals. He never ever says, you embarrassed me, Peter. You're an embarrassment. You never, he never once said, Peter, you're a failure. He never once did that. But this is what he does. He just inquires about Peter's love. That's all he ever does. Look at verse 15. 
So when they had dined, they finished breakfast. Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Now, what are the these referring to in verse number 15, when he says, lovest thou me more than these? Well, uh, some say that it could have been, Jesus could have been asking him, do you, do you love me more than the disciples love me? Do you love me more than these disciples? I mean, because after all, he did proclaim in Matthew chapter 26 that, uh, that, that if all would be offended by him, I never will. That, that's what he said there. It could be referring to that. It's possible that he could have meant, Peter, do you love me more than these, the, the fisherman lifestyle? Do you love me more than these? You got 153 fish. Do you love me more than this lifestyle that you reverted back to? Do you love me more than these? Now, now listen, we can spend all day trying to figure out what, did, what does these mean. L to be honest with you, that's not for us to figure out. That's for Peter to know. That was a conversation between the Lord Jesus Christ and Peter. But the, the, the main emphasis was this. Peter was, uh, Jesus was asking Peter, Peter, do you love me? That was it. Do you love me, Peter? Verse 15, second part of verse 15 says, He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said, Lord, you know I love you. Now, I know, I'm sure many of you know, that when the Lord asked, Do you love me? He, was, he used the word agape for the word love. That's the, the highest unconditional love. And Peter responded by answering, Yea, Lord, you, thou knowest that I love thee. And Peter referred to, uh, used the phileo type of love, which is a different love. But, and I'm aware of that. But regardless of Peter's answer, the, 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 evidently the Lord didn't seem bothered by it because the Lord said this, feed my lambs. That's what he said. He said, feed my lambs. And then verse 16, he saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Okay, so this is what happened. Jesus asked Peter again the same question, and Peter answered the same way. However, this time, Jesus answered with, Feed my lambs. He didn't say, uh, or, or he, he answered differently from feed my lambs. He said, Feed my sheep the second time. So we might be thinking, What's the big deal? What's the big deal between saying, feed my lambs and feed my sheep? Well, I don't really see a big significance there. Well, understand, the first time when Jesus said, feed my lambs, the Greek word for feed has to do with providing food for the flock. That, that, that's, what, that's what that means there, to provide food for that. The second word for feed is a different Greek word, and it means to tend or to shepherd the flock. So th there's two different meanings there. There's one to feed the flock, and there's another to tend to the flock, protect the flock. So Jesus was saying this, my lambs need fed, and my sheep need bled. That's what he was saying. My lambs need fed, and my sheep need led. Now look at verse 17. He saith unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. <laughs> Peter was bothered by the fact that he asked him a third time. I mean, here's Peter. He's just saying, Lord, you know everything already. You already know that I love you. And listen, I don't think Peter's being dishonest. I really don't. I think Peter was trying to be honest with himself. I think he was trying to be honest with Jesus. I think he was trying to be honest with those disciples that might have been present. He says, Lord, you already know that I love you. And then here's what the Lord says, feed my sheep. He says, feed my sheep again. This time the word feed in this verse is the same that it's used in verse number 15 regarding to the lambs. The sheep not only need led, but they also need fed. So what's the point here? Here's what Jesus is trying to get across to Peter. Peter, I'm letting you know, I'm still not done with you. I'm still not done with you yet, Peter. You've denied me three times. And now I'm asking you three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love you. Feed my, sh uh, feed my lambs. They need fed. L do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. My sheep need led. 
Do you love me? Lord, you know already that I love you. Then feed my sheep. My flock needs attended to, Peter. I'm still not done with you. You might have given up on yourself, Peter, but I'm still not done with you yet. Yeah. He's letting Peter know I'm not done with you. Peter, I'm bringing you up. This is what this is what he's doing. Peter, I'm bringing you to a place of restoration so that you can be used again, even after your failure. Praise God for restoration. And here's the truth, ladies and gentlemen. As you live your life, okay, look, look here, look here. I want everyone's eyeballs on me. As you live your life, you will fail God. You will fail him. I will fail him. You will fail him as a Christian. I will fail him as a Christian. You, you, you might fail him as a church member. I might fail him as a pastor. Here's the thing. We will fail him. But I'm so very thankful that the Lord Jesus Christ, who, who took Peter, who denied him three times, and he's saying, I'm bringing you to a place of restoration. I'm bringing you to a place where you can still be used by me. I'm not done with you yet. That same God is the same God we serve today. That same God is the same God we preach about even today. Listen, you will fail him. I will fail him. But praise God, he can restore you and bring you to a place where you can still be used by him. But there was a determining factor that Jesus was trying to reveal to Peter. If restoration was going to begin, something needed to be determined. If the restoration process was going to, un to undergo its way, something needed to be determined. And what was that? Peter, do you love me? You know, in order for restoration to start, this is where it begins. Love for Jesus. You wait. Come on. Are you awake? If restoration is going to start, it's going to start by this. Your love for the Lord Jesus Christ. This is. Notice what the Lord Jesus, what he does. He, he even speaks about Peter's death in verse number 18 and 19. Look there. It says, verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. And when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. And then look here, it says, This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. Here, here's what Jesus was letting Peter know, that his death will ultimately glorify God. Uh, you know, it's, it's historical writers would say how, how Peter was martyred. Uh, it, Peter was martyred. Listen, he was going to be nailed to a cross like the Lord Jesus was. But what did Peter say? Listen, P Peter said, listen, I don't deserve to die the same way Jesus died. So he said, so Peter, he wanted to be uh, executed upside down on his cross. And, and what the Lord Jesus was saying here, he says, this spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. So what does this mean for Peter? Jesus was assuring Peter, listen, you'll, because of restoration takes place, you will be faithful until the day you die. That's encouraging. You'll be faithful until you're no longer here. And then, last part of verse 19. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. <laughs> that must have been the most beautiful words Peter could have ever heard again. Come on, wake up church. Let's remind ourselves. When Peter heard those words the first time, he was just, it was three and a half years prior and he was mending his nets with his brothers. And then the Lord Jesus says, I will make you fishers of men. Throw down your nets. Follow me. And that's exactly what he did. He dropped his nets and he followed the Lord Jesus Christ. And for the next three and a half years, it would be the most unforgettable three and a half years of that man's life. You awake? Come on. Let's, let's understand. For the next three and a half years, he lived. He ate where Jesus slept. That's where he slept. Where Jesus awoke. That's where he awoke. He heard the best preacher preach in the synagogues over and over again. He saw the blind be healed. He saw the deaf uh, be, being able to, 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 to hear again. He caused the blind to see. He caused the dead to rise. He walked on water. He walked on water is what he did. He, he did. He's seen all these things take place. 
The next three and a half years would be absolutely astounding. He, he, the Lord Jesus used he and the 11 other disciples to feed the multitudes many times. It's what he's done. And then and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he denies the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know him. And then he curses. He curses. He's thinking, my relationship with him is over. It's done. It's finished. Until one morning, Jesus makes him breakfast. And just asks him if he loves him. And he tells him, I still got a job for you, Peter. And then he hears those words all over again. Follow me. Wow. Don't tell me that our God's not merciful and gracious. Don't tell me. If this isn't mercy and grace, I don't know what is. I really have no earthly idea what mercy and grace is. If this is not it. If this isn't a perfect example or a perfect picture of it. Listen. Like I said, you're going to fail God. And so am I. But I'm thankful we serve a God who wants to restore us to a place of serving him. Hey, listen, the best life to live is a life to serve him. That really is the best life. To, to, to serve him, to allow him make the orders, to allow him you know, to follow his orders. That really is the best life to live. But listen, after we fail him. We have to determine one thing if restoration is going to take place. And here it is. Do you love him? That's it. Do you love him? Listen, after Peter denied Christ, it was damaging to Peter. Damaging. Hey, look here. I want you to know this. Sin is damaging. Sin is damaging. Sin will damage your home. Sin will damage your marriage. Sin will damage your testimony. Sin will damage your relationships with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Sin will damage your relationship with your spouse. Sin will damage your relationship with your children. Sin will damage the relationships to those who are closest to you. Sin can damage and, and the consequences of sin can really last a lifetime. They really can. Sin is completely damaging. Come on, we know the quote. Sin will, uh, 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 sin will take you farther than you want to go. Keep you longer than you want to stay. Make you pay more than you want to pay. That's what sin will do to you, ladies and gentlemen. It will damage each and every area of your life. Now, evidently, Peter thought that restoration was not a possibility. Peter, he didn't think that. Hey, listen, oftentimes we look at our failures and we think our sin is too great. There's no way I can go any longer serving him. Come on, l let's be real here. If we're not careful... We can allow sin to rule our lives for so long and so much and be in our homes for so often that it can damage all those different areas. And we might say this, my sin has caused too much pain. My sin has caused too much damage. My sin has marred my testimony at church. My sin has marred my testimony at work. My sin has marred my testimony in the community my, that sin has damaged my family so much. There's, there's anger and there's bitterness in my home. No one will ever take me seriously as ever being a Christian again. I've done too much damage. Why bother serving God? Why bother trying to serve him? You don't know my testimony. It's too damaging. Damaging is too great. And listen, I'm not here to question your sin. If, if you've ever thought those types of thoughts, and you just thought, you know, it's just better if I just quit this whole Christian thing. It's just better if I just quit this whole going to church thing. It's just better if I just quit this whole Bible reading thing. It's just, it's just better if I just quit praying. It's just, it, nothing seems to be working, and my, and my life is too damaging. There's just too much baggage that I have in my life. There's too much baggage that I have in my family. There's too much baggage that I just have going on. It's just, you know, it, it's just better if I just go back to my old way of life. It's just better if I just, listen, look here. It's just better if I just go fishing. Connecting the dots. It's just better if I go back to the old way. Okay, if you've ever thought those types of thoughts, Look here, look here, look here. If you've ever thought those types of thoughts, you need to ask yourself just this question. 
do you love him? Do you love him? Do you love him more than these? What are these? What does these mean? Do you love him more than the lifestyle that you're willing to leave the Christian lifestyle for so that you can live the old way again? Do you love him more than that? Do, do you love him more than the sinful choices that got you in that mess? You love him more than those? Do you, do you love him more than the sinful choices that caused your family the pain? Do you love him more than that? Do you love him? Listen, Peter, Jesus didn't go to Peter and say, Peter, you owe me an apology. Did he do that? He didn't say, Peter, you're an embarrassment. And if you want to get right with me, then you must sacrifice. You must do this. You must do that. Did he do that? He just asked him a question. Do you love me? Listen, if restoration is going to take place, if restoration is going to begin, you know your sinful choices. I know my sinful choices. But if restoration is ever going to take place and that there's going to be a mending of relationship between myself and the Lord Jesus and yourself and the Lord Jesus, if there's ever going to be a restoration process take place, it must start here. You must love him. You must love him. L listen, you need to... Turn from your sin and turn unto him. Now listen, understand, you need to have the right motive when you turn from your sin. Uh, oh, I've, I've seen this before, and I know you've seen this before, that when life gets hard, people find, they go looking for Jesus. Come on. When life gets hard, when they go into the world and the world beats them up, they say, well, I, I know I just need to get in church. Well, I know I just need Jesus. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn from my old way. I'm going to turn unto Jesus because when I turn unto Jesus, then there's blessings. Then life is easier. He takes away my problems. L listen, don't get me wrong. Turning to Jesus is the best life to live. And turning to Jesus is a life full of blessings. But he doesn't want you to turn from your sin just so that he can make your life easier. He wants you to turn from your sin. Look here. So that out of love for him. Because if all you do, oh, I'm going to go to church to make life better. Read my Bible to make life better. I'm going to pray every day to receive the blessings and make life better. You're still thinking of yourself. He doesn't want you to repent so that you can just inherit the blessings. He wants you to repent because you love him. You love him more than these. That's why he wants you to repent. Listen, there might be some people here today that the Lord, and he might, brought, might have brought some things to your mind, might have brought some, maybe some decisions that you've made. And you might be even thinking to yourself, you know, the, the, the Christian life, I don't even know why I even bother. But listen, 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 listen. If you love him and you turn to him, the invitation's still open. Follow me. The invitation's still there. Follow me. But it starts by loving him. Well, how do I love him? Well, let me just tell you what he said. I didn't say it. He said it. If you love me, keep my... Come on. You already know. If you love me, Keep my commandments. What does that mean? Where's his commandments? Right here. Here's his commandments. Listen, if you love him, do what it says. That's hard, right? If you love him, do what he says. Do what he says, apply what he says, and you'll love him. If you love me, keep my commandments. And listen, and here's the thing, we can be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, I'm not, I don't want to know your baggage. I really don't. But I'm thankful that his grace is bigger than our baggage. I'm very, very thankful that his grace is bigger than our baggage. I'm very, very thankful that his mercy is greater than our sin. I'm very, very thankful of that. And listen, you might have done a lot of damage in your past. You may have done a lot of damage in your life. You may have, there might be a, a lot of people who are hurting because of your sinful choices. But, but here's the thing. If, 
If you're going to have restoration take place and those relationships be rebuilt and you have a closer walk with God more than ever before, it, will, it must start by you having a love for Jesus. Listen, there's a, love, there's a difference between having a love for Jesus and just saying, I love Jesus. Everybody with me? There's a difference there. If you love me, keep my commandments. Here's the thing. You can't love him apart from the word of God. You just can't do it. You can't love him and do things that go contrary to the word. You can't do it. You can't love him and say, well, I love him and live your life apart from the scriptures. You can't do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And listen, and you can have a restored relationship with him. Listen, until the day you die. We serve a wonderful God. We serve a very gracious God. We serve a merciful God. Don't be like Peter. I'm gone fishing. I give it up. No, no, no. He's not done with you yet. He might not have even started with you yet. <laughs> he can use you in ways that are just beyond your comprehension. And he did use Peter in a magnificent way on the day of Pentecost. Where he stood up and he preached. And 3,000 people were saved, they were baptized, they were added to the church. The church exploded in memberships that way. A whole lot different from the man who denied him. Yeah. Hey, listen. Do you love him? That's really where it starts. Do you love him? You gotta ask yourself the question, do, do I love him? Do I love him? Well, if I love him, then I'm gonna do what his word says. How have I been doing with keeping his word? Have I been doing and getting in the word? How am I doing with applying the word, studying the word, memorizing the word, letting the word get into my heart that I might hide his word in my heart that I might not sin against God? How have I been doing against that? Do you love him? Because that's where restoration starts. A love for Jesus. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this.